folks, this is Ron Longwell, and I'm glad you're here today for another episode of the Jesus Society Podcast, a conversation exploring relationship, renewal, and purpose in the kingdom of God. This is episode 63 uh, of the Jesus Society Podcast, and um, I was going to do something different today, but I decided to put that off till next week just because uh, there's something else. I'll, I'll just give you a, a, a hint, a clue. Um, Starting next week, I want to I want to start talking uh, about. Uh, I guess, I guess this is what I'm going to say right now. This is subject to change um, in what I call it or how I approach it. I want to talk about manhood in the kingdom of God. What it means to be a man of God, a man of God. What it means to be men of God. Um, and I want to explore some of the stuff having to do with husbands and fathers and the lack of fathers and growing up without a father or growing up with a bad father and how all those things kind of hamstring our ability to, to be the kind of men that God wants us to be uh, for the sake of our families, um, for the sake of the world. Okay, so... Um, I'm thinking about calling it the. It, it'll probably be a little series, and I'm thinking about calling it Kingdom Dudes. How about that? That sound cool. Anyway, I was going to jump into that today, but but I'm going to beat a dead horse a little bit today instead. Um, so <laughs> today, what I want to try to do in as succinct a way as I as I can do it, I want to I want to explain. Uh, try to explain a phrase that Paul uses in Romans chapter 5 verse 17 that I think has caused a lot of confusion for folks. Um, And I'll I'll tell you the phrase and then we'll kind of unpack it. I'll get to it eventually here. Um, Paul talks about how Christians will, and he uses the phrase, reign in life. Okay? Uh, Christians will reign in life. And you can go up, you can go ahead and look at Romans 5.17 right now. You can pause this and go look at that. We're going to come back and, and read the whole thing and talk about it in a, in a few minutes. But, um, you know, that's an interesting phrase. And um, I've, I've talked to a number of people that have struggled to understand what that means. And, you know, you can just sort of pull that phrase right up off the page um, out of the context of Romans, not to mention the whole rest of the Bible, and just start kind of trying to guess about what that might mean, uh, which is the way I think most of us usually try to understand unusual phrases in the Bible is we just pull them out and we scratch our heads and we uh, just trying to kind of try to mentally guess about that, which is never usually the best way to do that because we, we tend to come up with all sorts of fanciful ideas when we do it that way. Um, and I've, I've been around some people that have tried that with that phrase um, I think we can do better than that, and that's what I want to try to do today. And I'll just let you know uh, the stuff we're going to talk about here. I've talked about some of this stuff before, okay? So when you get into this, you may roll your eyes and say, oh my gosh, Ron, I'm tired of hearing about this. You've talked about this before. Well, okay, I have, right? And I'm beating a dead horse a little bit. Um, uh, astute listeners might remember some of this conversation back in episode 50, um, and really um, dedicated Jesus Society podcast listeners um, might, if, if you're still around listening to this and you've been listening to it from the beginning, I love you. I really love you. Um, in episode two and episode three, way back year, we way back last year, um, before we even knew about a pandemic, um, I was talking about some of this kind of stuff, okay? And I'm going to put links in the show notes for all three of those episodes. And if you want to do kind of a deeper dive into some of this stuff, you can go back and listen to that. But I'm trying to, I want to do this today. I want to tackle this again today, but I want to do it as succinctly as I can. And and here's why. The the stuff we're going to talk about today and that, that I've talked about in those other episodes, this has been an unfolding truth for me over the last year or so. And it is, it is for me a huge deal. And I continue to grow in my understanding of these issues. And I'll just tell you, these kind of things have been life-changing for me. 
okay? I think this kind of stuff is a really, really, really big deal. And I hope that the way we talk about this today is going to be a little different than the way we've talked about it before. I, I think, like, if you hang with me here and, and let me talk through this again, you're going to like this. I think you're just going to really like this. Um, there's a lot of hope and a lot of life and a lot of joy in, in what I'm going to talk about here today. So, hang on, i got to get some coffee here. Some of you, some of you have told me that you really like it when I sip coffee <laughs> on this podcast, which I think is kind of funny. Um, I, I don't do it because I think it sounds cool. I do it because I like coffee and I need some coffee in the morning. Um, although the morning uh, today is getting a little long in the tooth. It's, it's almost lunchtime, but I'm still drinking coffee. Okay, to, to, to kind of set the stage for understanding Paul's phrase in Romans 5, um, we've got to start back in the beginning, in Genesis, in creation. Um, Genesis 1 and 2. So God created the world initially to be the place where he would dwell among his creation. Um, the garden was a, a temple uh, of sorts. And, and there's some, like, like I, can't, I can't get into why that is and how that is, but, but I could ask you to trust me, but I wouldn't trust me if, if I didn't flush this out. So I'm not going to say that. But um, there is, there is, the people in the ancient Near East, when they heard Genesis 1, they would, they would have immediately caught it as temple language, okay? Um, but in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, so, so, so the garden was God's temple. It was the place where he dwelt in the midst of his creation. Okay, that's what it was supposed to be. In Genesis 1, 26 through 28, God says this. Okay, these are familiar verses. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. Excuse me. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created the male and female. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. Okay. So God made man and woman. Okay. Don't get the idea here that we're excluding women. This is a this is a two-part deal here. Man and woman, they're together. God made them together to bear his image before the world. He says that twice in these verses, okay? And what he also says twice in these verses is that God made man and woman, okay, to rule over his creation. Now, as I've said before, and we talked about this, I think, back in episode 50, we need to define that word, rule, okay? Because after a long run of human history, the idea of ruling has been marred and tarred by all sorts of uh, unholy and destructive ideas, okay? Now, the Hebrew words in Genesis 128 translated as subdue, that's the Hebrew word kabas, and rule, that's the Hebrew word rada, those are strong words, okay? And they both imply exertion and effort and the imposing of one's will upon something else, Okay? But those are not terms that imply violence or abuse, all right? Sometimes when we hear, we, we think about ruling something, that's what we think of. We think of violence and abuse. That's not, what's, that's not inherent in these terms at all. In fact, throughout Jewish and Christian tradition, down through the ages, the dominant interpretation of those words in this context has been that they entail benevolent care for the rest of creation. Now, I kind of like the word, um, the, the, the ideas of tend or care for uh, to encapsulate, encapsulate those ideas because in God's world, rulership is benevolent and helpful and caring, okay? Humans were given from the outset in the garden the authority and, and vocation of tending and caring for creation in partnership with God. 
And so there's the idea of being co-regents with God, co-rulers, okay, um, with God over God's good world. And that is made clear, I think, in Genesis 2.15, where we're told that the Lord God took the man, placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. That The, the ideas of tending and caring for are, are there in Genesis 2.15 in the phrase, work it and watch over it. Okay, So God's original vocation for man is to bear his image and act as partners with him, co-regents, co-rulers, intending and caring for God's good world. Humans are not equal with God, okay? God is our benevolent ruler and we are in submission to him and he has given us, he's given mankind, at least that was the intention in the garden, the authority and and some degree of power to rule benevolently on his behalf, okay? And bear his image before the world. Mankind was given the vocation and the privilege to mediate God's presence and goodness to the creation in which we live. And God's idea for what that looks like is that humans will function as a kingdom of priests. And we've talked about those ideas before too. Standing in the gap between heaven and earth, bringing the blessing and goodness of God to his creation. Okay, that's God's intent on the front end of things, all right? However... That project was derailed in Genesis chapter 3 when sin entered the world. And and again, we discussed this a lot more fully in some of the previous episodes. And you can look at the show notes and go back and listen to those if you want to. But we need to understand when we talk about sin, we need to understand what sin really is here. And the truth is that sin in the Bible is predominantly idolatry. It is not just the breaking of rules or commandments. Okay? Um, moral imperfection. That's not, if we, there's an element of that I understand, but, but if we think that that's all sin is, we're missing the picture, okay? Sin is not just moral failure. Sin involves relinquishing our power and authority to, authority to a false God who then uses that power not for benevolent care, but for destruction and death. And we can see that in the garden, Right? When Adam and Eve succumb to the to the serpent, the issue is who's going to be my master? And it's for them, not God anymore. They listen to the serpent. They follow the serpent. The serpent is then their master. And in so doing, they, they abdicate their role as co-regents and they give some of that authority and power to the serpent. Okay? And the serpent and his minions will then use that power not for benevolent care, but for destruction and death. And that false god then enslaves us. And that is exactly what happened in the garden with the serpent. Adam and Eve walked away from that encounter with the serpent as slaves. And that is why the New Testament will talk so much about being slaves to sin. Most notably Paul in Romans chapter 6. Okay, so mankind was intended to be co-regents with God, providing benevolent care to God's good world, but we sinned, and in so doing, we relinquished our God-given authority over to what the Bible will call, uh, in subsequent books, the principalities and powers, who then enslaved us and unleashed destruction and death on the world. And the result of that is not just that we're in a bad way, Okay, this is not just about us, right? It's also that the creation is in a bad way because the original vocation of man's is un, is unfulfilled. And that is why Paul will say in Romans 8 that um, it's several, several passages right in line here, like verses 19 through 22, he'll say that the whole creation itself is frustrated waiting in eager anticipation for the sons of God to be revealed, groaning as in the pains of childbirth, and hoping to be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Verse 21. So the, the creation is struggling too. And the answer is, for the way Paul presents it there in those verses, the answer in the way 
the, the answer to creation's problems, creation is looking forward to the children of God being the, the solution to this, okay? All that because God's image is not being born before the world and there is no benevolent care happening. All right. So that's God's intent from from creation for man. That is the the way this all got derailed, okay? Now we we're going to spend some time in the book of Romans. We're going to kind of build up to this this verse in chapter 5 that we're going to talk about. And you may already kind of know where we're going here. So, one of the things you need to understand is in the book of Romans, Paul will will talk several times in the first four chapters of the book of Romans about sins. And when he talks about sin in the first four chapters, it's always sins, plural. Or we might think of it as small s, sins. Okay? But beginning in chapter 5, verse 12, and for, the, for I, I think the whole rest of the book, it's not sins anymore for Paul. It's sin, singular. Or we might think of it as capital S, sin. Okay? And that starts at chapter 5, verse 12. And that is not accidental, and it is not insignificant. Because for Paul, after chapter 5, verse 12 of Romans, sin is a force. It is a power that enslaves us. And remember again, the, the New Testament talks about being enslaved to sin in chapter 6. The New Testament talks a lot also about um, the rulers and authorities, the principalities and powers, the prince of the power of the air. It will use those terms interchangeably. They're all terms for capital S, sin, or Satan, okay? The, the power or force that has gained control over the world through manipulation and deception starting back in Genesis 3. And that is why Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 21, that sin reigned, reigned in death. Sin reigned in death. N.T. Wright says about these verses, he says, sin is a force or power that has been let loose in the world and that ultimately rules the world. Sin here seems to be the accumulation not just of human wrongdoings, but of the powers unleashed by idolatry and wickedness, the powers that humans were supposed to have, but that through idolatry they had handed over to the non-gods. Paul then uses the word sin, capital S, sin, as a personification of all this. So sin is now reigning and ruling because we have given it by our willing submission the authority and power to do so. Authority and power, remember, that God intended for us to use benevolently in the world. But, and here is the good news in all this, okay? In chapter 5, verse 17, Paul says this, since by the one man's trespass, and he's talking about Adam here back in Genesis 3, okay? So Paul is tying this back to that, the, the fall in Genesis 3. Since by the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. There's our word again. There's this idea of reigning and ruling. Since by the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So putting this all together and and. My gosh, this is huge. So, so sin reigned in death, but we, through our union with Jesus, who freed us from the slavery of sin by his death, we now reign in life. See, sin produces death. We produce life because we provide benevolent care in the name of God. 
So through Jesus' death, God is restoring those of us who who ally ourselves with him to our rightful place as co-regents with him. He's he's restoring the creation. Okay? The New Testament will refer to that as the new creation. The New Testament and the Old. Okay? The Old Testament talks about new creation also. And so in our renewed and restored roles, we have a vocation, the original vocation, to provide benevolent care, renewal, and healing for a broken world, a world that has been enslaved by the powers of darkness. And the resurrection of Jesus was, the the death and resurrection of Jesus, but the resurrection specifically in that, it, it was a watershed event in that it signaled the start of God's new creation. When Jesus walked out of that tomb, he walked out as a, as a new kind of human. Okay. And we, as God's redeemed people, we now get to join God in that work of new creation, of, of recreating the world. And what that means is that we have a new and vital vocation in this world, extending God's benevolent care, his redemption, his his healing, life, in other words, because we reign in life, right, throughout the world. And that means, folks, that we are valuable and important, every single one of us. And so the end result is that Jesus is renewing and restoring those of us who choose to follow him to be what God intended human beings to be from the very beginning. And that is why Paul can say in Romans 5.17 that those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And that is why what Jesus accomplished on the cross and in his resurrection is so utterly revolutionary. In Matthew chapter 13, and I'm going to finish up with this, Jesus tells the parable that we now know as the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And the parable goes like this. The kingdom of heaven, he says, may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while people were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then left. And when the plants sprouted and produced grain, the weeds also appeared. And the landowner's servants came to him him and said, Master, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then where'd the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he told them. So do you want us to go and pull the weeds up? The servants asked him. No, he said, when you pull up the weeds, you might also uproot the wheat with them. So let everything grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and tie them in bundles to burn them, but collect the wheat in my barn. So that's that's the parable. A few verses later, in verses 36 and following, the disciples ask him, because they were a little confused by this too. They said, Tell us what what that means. And Jesus says this, and this is so huge. He says, the one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, the Messiah, Jesus. The field is the world. And the good seed, these are the children of the kingdom. Did you hear that? The good seed that the the Lord is sowing in the world is you. You, as followers of the king, are the good seed. God has redeemed you through Jesus Christ and, and sown you into the world just as you are and right where you are to provide benevolent care, love, and mercy, and hope, and grace, and recovery, and healing in his name 
for the benefit of the world that he so loves. God is renewing and restoring his creation, and you and I as Christians are vital parts of that. We, we reign in life. And that is both humbling and thrilling. And with that, I want to thank you for joining us today. I hope you'll join us again next week. As always, we'd appreciate it if you tell others about the podcast. Please share this episode with folks. Um, if you don't share any others, please share this one. And if you enjoy the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon Music, all kinds of places throughout the world, okay? Please visit us on our Facebook page for the Jesus Society podcast. Check out our website, thejesussociety.com. Um, we've, we're loading all of our content on YouTube and um, uh, the, the uh, alt-tech platform, Odyssey. Um, so if Christians ever get banned, you'll always be able to find us there. Um, and if you search for the Jesus Society podcast on either YouTube or Odyssey, you'll, you'll find us. If you'd like to support the show and my related ministry, um, there's a Patreon page. You can do that there. Um, and the link is in the show notes uh, for that. Thanks for listening. And remember, you are greatly loved. <laughs>